Well, let's all get started. Um, thank you very much for joining us, everyone, today. Uh, my name is Christine Biglin. I'm with the St. Mary's County Library. Um, and this fall, we are running a series of programs called Community Conversations on Race. And this program is one of the, the 10 things we have going on this fall uh, to try to spur conversation um, from different aspects and taking different avenues with it. And today we're gonna be talking about the TED Talk by Titus Kafar that's called, How Can Beauty Open Our Hearts to Difficult Conversations? Uh, we have some area uh, community members that are gonna lead our discussion. So to start, I would like to introduce our moderator, Christine Bergmark. Um, she, I'm very honored to have her with us. She has been the moderator of other discussions like the big conversations in Calvert County and St. Mary's County. Uh, she has also been the moderator for Shut Up and Listen discussions and she is the manager of the TEDx Great Mills. So welcome, Christine. Uh, passing it to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect, 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 perfect. Well, thank you, and it's such an honor to, to be part of the series. Uh, we're excited to, um, to bring this to you. I'm gonna quickly introduce our four panelists, and, and then Christine will show the, the TED clip, and then we will start our conversation. So, uh, one of our panelists is Kelsey Bush. He was born on the Naval Air local marriage. I traces her roots to the Tudor Hall and Sodderley Plantation. Attended, he attended Little Flower, graduated from Great Mills High School, science and sociology from St. Mary's College of, of Maine. Currently, Kelsey rides in, resides in California, Maryland with his family, and he is the interim chief diversity officer for St. Mary's College of Maryland. Welcome, Kelsey. Next up, we have Roz. Roz Racanella is a working artist. She's had a long career in advertising in New York and heritage tourism here in Southern Maryland. Now, in addition to creating and exhibiting her own art, she consults with nonprofits to create public art projects and events. You can see her work at www.racanella.com, and we can put that, the link up there. Uh, Roz has done a number of, the mural, <laughs> number of the murals around Lexington Park, um, so thank you and welcome, Roz. Thank you. Um, next up, Barbara. Barbara Bershon is a board member of the St. Mary's County Arts Council. She's also the vice chair of the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation and the past chair of the Maryland State Arts Council. Welcome, Barbara. Thanks. And Mike Brown. Mike is the immediate past president of the St. Mary's Arts Council board. He has resided in St. Mary's County for almost 40 years. He likes to say he has no art skills whatsoever, but has an extreme appreciation for all arts. One of his passions is to bring art to all people of St. Mary's County, no matter their age, income, or ethnicity. He's on the board for the United Committee for Afro-American Afro Contributions and is instrumental in organizing the Lexington Park Juneteenth celebration. He was born in Washington, D.C. and moved to the county in 1968 after the riots due to Mr. King. His dad wanted to get his boys out of the city because it had changed. He graduated from Bowie State University. He was hired as the first park ranger in Southern Maryland in 1987, retired as a game warden, and as we said before, is involved in many other um, Maryland community organizations. So welcome, Mike. So with that, Christine, you wanna take it away with the, with the TED Talk? Thank you so much, Christine, and, and St. Mary's County Library for, for bringing that TED to us, that TED Talk to us. Um, Titus Kaffer tells really profound stories with his artwork in, in, you know, he starts off with the concept of we were there just because you couldn't see us didn't mean we weren't there. Um, in Drawing the Blinds and Behind the Myth of Benevolence, Titus talks about the people behind the curtain, the black women behind uh, Thomas Jefferson and all the black women uh, that were behind those plantations. And he talks about how largely the black story is missing from the history that we talk about. 
when, when Titus talks about the importance of seeing each other, he's talking in part, he was referring to the Jerome project where he was looking for his father's mugshot to reacquaint himself after 15 years. And he paints mugshots of, of these other men that he saw covered in tar. In another fight for remembrance, he talks about the violence of police and being stopped by armed police by visiting the galleries just to see his own work. In his From a Tropical Spaces, um, he portrays the silhouettes of children being stripped away from their mothers. He talks of how children from bl of Black women are disappearing and, and the struggles of Black women to, to set their children on the life, you know, the path of life. And then he concludes with how uh, beauty and truth are intertwined and beauty is complicated because of the way we define it and that there's beauty in truth telling. So with that, we have a couple of questions um, that I'd like to pose to our panelists and I would invite anybody who is also in, our att in the attendees to um, post a uh, question in the, in the chat or in the q and I'm not sure, Christine will probably tell us which one that is um, in the chat room. So, because we wanna hear your questions too and, and interact with you. So the first question I have, and oh, and by the way, um, our plan is to finish up by 8.15, recognizing that there are two presidential town halls tonight. We may try to wrap up a little closer to eight, um, but we had scheduled till 8.15. So I'm gonna start off with the first question. This really is to any one of you as panelists, you know, feel free to chime in. And, but which of his works, um, and to you attendees also, which, which of Titus's works spoke most deeply to you and what messages about, about Black life in the USA today were most striking to you in, in, um, in Titus's work? And I'll, I'll leave it open to you. Well, I can speak and say that um, the, from a tropical space, the ones of mothers holding their missing infant children, he actually has another one. I don't think he shows it in this TED talk that was on the cover of Time, a portrait of George Floyd as an infant with his mother holding him. And it struck me as such a, deep underscoring of when you erase a life. I mean, there's a mother holding her baby. When, it, when is a person more important than when their mother is holding them for the camera? And the person is just gone, just taken away as if he was meaningless. It really struck me. It's very powerful. This is Mike, I have a comment. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. It was a painting that he did. It was by Franz Hall. And it was a picture of a wealthy gentleman and his wife, I think. His family. Yeah. And it was a little black boy that was at the mm -hmm. in the picture. Mm -hmm. But from he explained, you know, the reason. Well, the man was taller than everybody and it was showing some jewelry that the wife had and silk dress and he said painting art visual art has a language too and uh i thought that was interesting but and then in one of his ted talks he talked about uh whiting out mm -hmm the person and just showing uh, the little black boy, I guess. But he used the term shifting our gaze. And uh, I thought that was powerful. Um, so often we just see things face value, but maybe changing your gaze and seeing something totally different. But I, I, I thought that was very good. That spoke to me that artwork. He does a whole TED talk on that one artwork. I think you saw it and I saw it too, where he actually demonstrates whiting out the other figures. It's very powerful to watch and it makes so clear what he's trying to say because he uses that visual language very clearly to show. He whites out the figures one by one and talks about their impact. This one's important for this and that and just leaves the little boy. Yes. Yeah. And in that TED talk, which I encourage you all to watch, um, he actually talks about how there's more information available on the manufacture of the lace on mm -hmm. the one collar than there is of that young. Uh, there's black no mention of him. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, I was going right, to say yeah. that the the uh, Jerome projects uh, really spoke to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, here he was taking church icons 
you know, things that are historically seen as the most beautiful artwork ever, and really focusing on beautiful men who were uh, who were lost to our society mm -hmm. in prison. And he, this this whole notion of of, of truth and beauty being intertwined, it, it just speaks to me so clearly. And that we can hear all these words, but something about seeing it visually in the way he is able to present it just brings it to the forefront and gets us, to, I, I, at least for me, to understand it in a way that I don't think I could understand it in any other way. And it's done so so beautifully, yet subtly in so many ways. You know, the social implications with that also, the fact that, you know, each one is based on the number of years that they've been lost mm -hmm. to their community, to their families. And it's kind of the impact that's associated with it. And sometimes you have to ask the question, you know, was it something that in some cases, if there was appropriate legal representation, right. they may have never gone to jail. Or was it, a, you know, was it something that was just because of the conditions of where, where they were because of the lack of opportunity? Or was it, you know, not to be anti-police or anything like that, but when you, you, you do things where it's like, okay, crime's here, you begin to over, when you begin to, you know, go to where crime is, you start a lot of times not really look where crime is. You know, you start over-policing in areas that may not need the over-policing, thusly seeing more crime. And those are some of the questions you can ask because, you know, if we went to the suburbs and say we had a war on drugs or into Potomac, Maryland and had a war on drugs at the same vigor that we did in the inner cities, would we get the same account of, you know, men or young men being taken out of homes in the same fashion? when statistically we know that, at least in the drug trade at least, that that's usually where the you can find a lot of the users of that substance, mm -hmm. but it's not policed in the same fashion. So it's just one of those, you know, not to say there's inequities, but it's that ramification of policy and how things are done and the long-term effects that, that occur over time, so. Well, and you, you, you started out that by saying it's kind of where you're looking for the crime, right? And that is so well illustrated in his discussion on uh, another fight for re remembrance, right? Where yeah. he's, he's going to the galleries in New York City to look at his own work. The police stop him and they say they've been following him for two hours because two men were going in and out of galleries. Had it been two people of white, that would have never happened. So that's where the eyes were looking. Well, I, I think, it, I mean, if you haven't had a chance yet, I'm in the midst of reading the book Cast. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that falls right into it because of the simple fact that, you know, it's not what we normally see. You know, we don't normally see, or in our perception, we don't normally see that, you know, there are, are two probably early 30 African-American males that are appreciating art. We don't put them there. So, therefore, they stick out. You know, it's kind of like that same thing when you when you go into businesses. You know, if you see a see a person who's sweeping the floor and happens to be a person, uh, you know, that is a person of color, that doesn't draw your attention. But if the person comes in in a suit, a tie, or whatever, or is the manager, that's when you're like, wow, is that the you know? That's where your mind starts playing tricks on you because so, you know, societally, we're not trained to look for that. And we, you know, even though we're not, you know, we don't do it intentionally, the way that, you know, we've been constructed in some ways, certain things seem normal and other things seem abnormal. You know, it's no, you can say the same thing with gender roles and things along those lines, but it, it becomes very apparent sometimes when you look at people's status when it comes to positioning in, in job placement and places along those lines or, or where you're supposed to be rather than where you're not supposed to be. Yeah. So. Let me just to go back one to second. Just let me interrupt sure. one second. I'd like to encourage anybody, any of the attendees, the chat is open. So um, if you would love to hear your thoughts, if you have particular pieces that spoke to you, um, you know, and either you can pose a question or just give us your feedback, that would be wonderful. I've also put Raza's website up there. So I'm <laughs> sorry, Raza, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Go That's ahead. okay. I was just going to go back to what um, Mike and Barbara were talking about the Jerome project. The, I, he introduces them starting with showing icons. Icons are portraits of holy figures, holy faces that should be re revered and adored. 
and he uses mug shots and that really flips the coin on that one that you know these have value too and what interested me that he got started googling his father's name and he found not just his father's mugshot, 97 men with his father's first and last name had mugshots. And that's where he really, I think, explains to everyone, there are just way too many people going to prison. I mean, this is crazy. The, um, the mass incarceration that spoke strongly of that to me. Also the picture of um, his portrait of George Lloyd, when he talks about it, his mother is holding this now empty space because he actually cut the child away and he describes her as holding the contour of her loss he for someone who is a visual artist he's good with his words too i mean that was really powerful to me he, she's holding the contour of her loss yeah i'd like to say that actually i ran into i not ran into i saw these paintings when we were at the American history, I mean, sorry, the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I saw these paintings and I, in fact, I, I'm sure I took pictures of them because I was so intrigued and especially of the ones of the forced, the contradictions in you know, the San, uh, <laughs> Sally Hemings and the, um, and the, and the Thomas Jefferson. I mean, it, it is so, and there was, a, there was a series of them. That was just one of them. Yeah. Where there was, there was the contradiction, the forced contradiction, which I think he does so beautifully because it gets you to stop and look and think in a way that you can read this in a book, but to see it visually, yeah. it is so powerful. And that's why I think art is just so important in our world today to get people to really go beyond you know, it's, it's almost beyond verbal. You, you really take it into yeah. your soul when, yeah. when, when you see these images. He is that rare artist who conceptualizes something and then his actual execution of the artwork is also so perfect that there's no mistaking. It's absolutely clear what he's trying to say. No words are necessary. He's good with his words, but his, his images are perfect in themselves. It's, it's so pretty remarkable. So powerful. Let me, let me shift us to our second question. Um, which is you know, so so what conversations should we having should we be having right now uh, to bring about change what are what are some of your thoughts on that as well as anybody that's out there um, in the uh, at listening to the to our panelists what so what, what conversations should we would should we be having right now to start making change I would suggest to me the com truth needs to be told America <laughs> Well, we're talking about art, but I, I'm going to just use America. America has not realized or come to term with the truth of our past. And we can never, we keep coming back to this place of conflict and stuff because we haven't told the truth of our past. And... The evils, I think it all goes back to slavery. Of course. And the way Native Americans have had to deal with this too. But America absolutely is not has not solved and told truth. And I think we'll keep coming back to that to the problems mm -hmm. we have today. Right. Truth. So truth needs to be told. And we have I, I would I would take it a little further. You're saying truth. I'd say trauma. We are not dealing with the trauma that we have inflicted upon ourselves as a country and on our people. If we if we were going through therapy the way that we have founded our country, a therapist would have ejected us a long time ago because we haven't been able to do the heavy work. I'm sorry. You know, we, we think the little things that we've done by the passage of laws is enough. But we haven't done the discussion, the reconciliation, and everything mm -hmm. that's necessary to really have the true discussions about what occurred in our country. Because we will sit here and say, that happened a long time ago. But, you know, I have conversations, you know, for, you know when we, we have conversations with friends that are, are Christians, they follow the Bible. You could say the same thing about the Bible is that it happened a long time ago, but you're following the teachings in it. You're always going back to it and using it as a touchstone. 
Why is it when we discuss history in our pain, we want to avoid it? We don't want to bring up, you know, that hurt, that the the the, the bad parts, and that's the that's where the hard work comes in. You know, if we only talk about our successes, then how much have we lied to ourselves when we haven't looked at where where we failed, or even if we succeeded, how we succeeded? Mm -hmm. So if we really told our history and and really blended everything together we'd have the reconciliation. And, and, and the thing is, if we kept coming back to it too, and not just like a one and off. You know, I look at what Germany's done, I, I look at what South Africa's done, and other countries that have had similar histories when it comes to atrocities. Yeah. We haven't done that. We kind of put yeah. blurbs out there and say, we're sorry, kind of, and then we move on instead of really having the deep, thoughtful, and insightful conversations. And honest, honest and, truth, and truthful. Yeah, true. we, we really love our band-aids. I mean, we don't really get to the difficult, painful parts of our history. Yeah, and Kelsey, I love that you started off saying, you know, we're not dealing with the trauma that we've inflicted. So it's, it goes, you know, the truth needs to be told, but also we need to acknowledge that trauma. I love that analogy. If, if the nation were, were under therapy, <laughs> we would have been that a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, you know, a good therapist would have looked at us and said, look, you ain't doing the work. You got to go. You, know, you coming here and us talking all the time, you're only talking about your good stuff. What yeah. about all this? <laughs> you brought it up. We know that's there. We're not doing the hard work, so you're going to have to find somebody else. So yeah. I'll tell you what America is good at is just saying, get over it. Um, get over it. That was a long time ago instead of um, – dealing with like you said just get over it mm -hmm. that was a while back it that's why i think this artwork is so important because it really gets us to that visceral area of not you don't get over it you don't get over it you have to face it in his artwork and i just i find it so empowering in many ways almost it's just it really it, 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 I, do we have you heard from any of the people what with us yeah yeah, I was going to chime in with in that, chat. but just to go back to that, I think you're so right, Mike, but, you know, then, and, 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 and you all have the similar stories, that Titus' story and that fight for remembrance, you know, it's not something that happened a long time ago. This happened to him within the last yeah, little bit of It's time. ongoing. Uh, it's yeah. ongoing. Yeah. So, yeah. so let me jump over here. There's a couple of thought, a couple questions in the chats, and this is uh, uh, to Mike. Um, I, I'll, I'll pose the two questions. So the first one is to Mike, what truth are we not telling? And then the second, so that's to Mike. And then the second question for any and all, what do you think is the best way to have conversation about that trauma? So maybe Mike, if you pick up that first one about what truth we're not telling and then uh, what's the I, best I, way to have conversation? I'm gonna just piggyback on what Kelsey said. The trauma of what America has done to African-Americans. Mm -hmm. give, give you a perfect example to me good friend of mine, me and her had a heated discussion because she said she's angry at Colin Kaepernick for night, you know, the not standing <laughs> kneeling. She was just so angry. It's disrespect to the flag. And I said, what he's doing is not have anything to do with the flag. I, I said, if you want to go there, and he's not being patriotic. I said, what about African Americans fought in every war that America has been in? And I used the example of the Civil War that 200,000 black men fought in the Civil War and everybody else came back parade and honor. And it was black men that was lynched in their Civil War uniform because of the hatred that they people had against them so and she ended up and i said he had paid he had relatives that were in the military um so he's not being disrespect but i said america has still not come to grip with under the same flag that they have treated african americans bad so bad that they can rejoice over, but blacks have a different 
perspective of it. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, Mike, you don't even have to go back to the rev um, to the Civil War. Think about you know, th yeah. there was a there was a Southern senator in World War One that more or less said, you know, don't put blacks in uniform because they're going to come back with pride in the and and you know what that's going to mean when they get here. I mean, yeah. and then you talk about what occurred during World War II for some of our troops, you know, being mm -hmm. trained in the South. You know, you're in full uniforms walking on sidewalks and you've got to get off and walk in the gutter because of the simple fact that, you know, a white child is on the si yeah. sidewalk. Nothing yeah. against the child, but you're serving a country yeah. that you have to keep yourself as a second, second class citizen in your full uniform, but they want you to be the torchbearer for the for the ideals but die for your country yeah, yeah. You put your life out on the line for the country and yet you should step aside for a child of a yes no yeah. so the other part of that question or the uh, sorry another question was what do you think is the best way to have conversation about about that trauma or about the trauma well i i think one of the first starts is um is within schools. I mean, that's, yeah. I'm not talking indoctrination or anything like that, but we need to change the focus of our history mm -hmm. and go from the focus of telling it as victors into a more appropriate telling of the truth and, and of what occurred and how it occurred and an understanding of how things are. And not in a, like to bash America, but in the simple fact that we gotta understand that A, it was a different time period when people came over. They didn't have YouTube, they didn't have Google, they didn't have satellites flying around the world. So there, there was a very narrow view. But in the same vein, you know, a lot of things they did in order to make themselves feel, feel better, they made people into second-class citizens. And we have to understand yeah. that. We have to understand that you know, race was created in this country in the, sense of, in the sense of using the color of your skin and not your country. We have yeah. to be honest about that. We have to be honest about, and what I mean by created in this country is we utilized it more than anybody else. I know that there's a Portuguese guy out there who actually came up with some of the terminology, but you know, we really perfected it here. I mean, <laughs> you know, the way I look at it is right here in St. Mary's County, you know, you have the example of Matthias de Souza, you know, a person of African descent being part of, you know, being a, a landowner after being an indentured servant and serving in the General Assembly, you know, of the time. And then less than six years later, we're enacting slave laws yeah. to make people that look just like him chattel slaves. You know, and the fact that we, you know, we were kind of, we perfected, you know, Jamestown did it first, but we perfected it here. You know, and the fact that we also enacted some of the first Mississippi Nation laws with, you know, our wonderful, you know, Irish Nell, who decided that, you know, love was more important than, than, you know, color of skin. And she married, married an, an Irish woman who married and became a slave because she loved, loved the slave by the name of Charles, you know? To, to, to go back to the point. Those are stories that we don't tell and you don't find yeah. out, you know, we don't find out until like you're an adult and you're doing more research. Yeah. You know, that's, it's, it's kind of sad that. in some senses, you know? Yeah, yeah. so changing the story from the Victor story to the, the truth about what happened. and, and Just the truth, it. just the truth, but you I, know? So, and there's so much to be learned. Uh, Kelsey, when you brought the Racial Equity Institute up here, and I attended that workshop um, a couple of years ago, that was such an eye-opener. Um, I mean, just the, just the the acts that were put through over time in history that really were to the benefit of, a very specific segment of population, that being particularly the white men, with the exception of the Pocahontas exception. But I'm sorry, Roz, I interrupted you. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think someone alluded to how they do it differently in other countries. And I don't know if it's still true, but it used to be that every school child in Germany visited Auschwitz. They all needed to know that this was part of our history and we will not do this again. And that, you know, we don't teach or the sins of America in the same way, because we're the victors, I guess, and we just walk away and turn around. But the truth is, if everything were handled in a more truthful and honest way, as I think Kelsey said, starting with school children, I don't think that we'd have nearly the problems we have today. Even when we're the loser, 
we yeah. don't tell well, the truth because it, it, well, you know, frankly, the Civil War. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, not yeah, to mention Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how many arguments have you have have we gotten in over the fact that a lot of people say that it's you know state rights? Yes. Yeah. But if you read if you read the Confederate Constitution, it says it was their states' rights to slavery. Yeah, state rights to own <laughs> slaves. So yeah. You can't you can't just stop at that part. You gotta you gotta take the whole thing, and that's the problem. Is we want the shortcut. And we don't want to look at the yes. impacts on other individuals. You it's know, not even a shortcut. It's, if you pardon the expression, a real whitewashing of history in every sense of the word. Okay. That, that you said that, <laughs> not me. I want to make sure that it's, it's known that I said you that. said that, not me. <laughs> it um, is a whitewashing of our history. I, I think we have a question. I just now. said that also. Barbara, you look like yeah. you wanted to jump in on that. No, I just, I know I'm agreeing with us. And, and I just feel that, you know, I, I think that he's the artist really summed it up at the end is that it, it's the it's the it's the creativity that we have to instill in, in our youth now because it is it's how we imagine the future mm -hmm. and that you know telling the truth uh to, to when children are, are starting out to, to the full story but then to have them imagine it in, in in how can we imagine to be a better world and i think that is the direction we have to, we have to move into and i think it's time this St. Mary's County develops some programs that helps children do this now. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a comment here um, in the chat that says, agreed, the truth should be told in school, start there. It might be too late for our generation, but that's how we can change that. I think it's never too late, personally. I think <laughs> it's never too late. I appreciate it's certainly very, very much. The, the, <laughs> thing the, is, the sooner the better. The sooner the, the sooner younger the better. better. The, I mean, the if they don't grow up with these with the, these ideas, it will be a better world. Yeah. The thing and is, pass them on to their children. Sorry, I'm just you know it, it's never too late. But the problem is right now we're in a situation in a country yeah. Yeah. where we don't want to have civil discourse. We don't want to. We don't want to listen to the other side. We want to talk over the other side. We don't want to have conversations and have understanding because we want to win. You know, that goes, that goes for both the left, that goes for, for the right. It is, it has gotten to the point that we have, we have grown into situations where if you don't agree with me on a checklist of, you know, 20 things, we might agree on 15 out of the, out of the 20, but if we don't agree of all 20, we, you know, I don't know if I could deal with you. Well, I'm with you on Kelsey. If we don't start beginning to find the areas of agreement, We've got to, and even if it's two or three, we've got to start finding the areas of agreement and then grow from there. I agree with you 100% on it. And that's the only way we're going to be able to have these conversations. That's right. Because that's the right. thing is, you know, we, you, people have to understand when we have difficult conversations, it's not an attack on you. Like one of the very first things they teach you in mediation, I'm, I mean, I'm going back, Christine, is that <laughs> arguing, you know, and having heated discussion but you're having discussion. You don't stifle that conversation if it's if if it seems productive. And that being that we have the two things that we're uncomfortable with in this country are silence and arguing. So the thing is that you try to find that happy medium in between, which ends up with fluff. Oh, and you can't eat fluff every day for it to be healthy. Now and then you got to have your Brussels sprouts, your, your, your asparagus, you know, and, and your other fruits and vegetables, even though you may not like them, but they're the best for you. Or your doctor going to tell you that you got to. One of the don't dis don't dis Brussels sprouts. I, I like Brussels them. Sprouts. No, I, I think sometimes too, when people argue, if they could just stop for a minute and hear themselves, they'll find some simple truths that are coming through, some needs, some hurts, some shame there's shame there too and i think that's a really hard one for white people in this country to talk about how shameful it is that we've done this to the african-american population to the native american population and we continue to do it because that's the, that's the way it's always been and we well, have to think well, I, mike, I, mike you look like you were going to jump in did you want to add something here <laughs> like i told we had discussed it just get um 
I used the term last week, old. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I know, I think most people want to build themselves up. So the, the division, I think, between African Americans and whites or what, if you can put somebody down, it will make you in your mind feel mm -hmm. better about yourself, the more that you yes. can put somebody down. And I, I think that's kind of fearful for people to do that. Um, if you can show the negative is, negatives about someone else, I want to share something. I think um, uh, Titus used it, talking about just seeing people. And Christine, you had, in int my introduction, talking about park ranger, I was the first African-American park ranger in Southern Maryland. Not park ranger, but first African. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I would go around the three counties and whatever, and it was like showing me off uh, for the agency because it, the mm -hmm. Department of Natural Resources had, had two uh, dissent decrees because it was such a racist organization. But when another African American come, came and was working with me, he was short and very dark skinned. And here I'm a, I was about a foot taller and my skin tone was light and people could not, they would get us mixed up so much. And I'm saying, <laughs> and he would look at me and we, and, and we were saying that they just see a face, African-American face, and they just weren't looking at me. I mean, I'm a foot tall and I, we kept saying, how are they calling me Charles and him Mike. It was just so frustrating. Yeah. You know, years, so they weren't seeing you. Yeah, they, they weren't were. seeing you. Yeah. And um and sometimes you just want people to see and I, I was in a situation where you felt I felt that I had the weight of the whole the next generation of park rangers coming because people were using me as a standard. And if I did something that wasn't right or whatever, it was like I was representing the whole race instead of individually, individuals. That's a lot of weight on your shoulders. It, it is. The whole career just, and a lot of African-Americans feel like that. When you, you just feel like you are carrying the whole weight of the race for something you did Instead of whites, it's just an individual. Or and didn't do. Yeah. 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 I mean, let me, let me segue into our last question as we're coming up on the hour. And that is, and Titus, and, and I think Barbara, you alluded to it, that the power of creativity can help, help change happen. And Titus talks about it takes creativity to imagine a future that's different from your own. And he, in his project, is engaging, uh, used in a powerful in it, that project in uh, New Haven called Next New Haven. And uh, from the perspective of the arts, um, is there anything like that in St. Mary's County? I think you, you mentioned that or, and a couple people touched on it. Mm -hmm. And if not, where, where could we develop something like that? Or how could we? It's, a, it's an amazing project. Anyone who finds Titus's work inspiring should look at what he's actually doing on the ground in New Haven. Um, it's a big, beautiful art studio and you can work there as an artist and, and get a stipend, but you also get a high school student. Um, and it's a great way to train young people. You know, we don't even, I think, have a place where an artist can have a studio in St. Mary's County, do we? We don't have a studio yes. complex. Or... Barbara, you have some uh, insight on some of where the opportunities might be coming about. Well, I don't know. Uh, well, the potential where we can. I think I think to go into the schools, and I know that the as you know, Christine too, because the arts council supports all kinds of projects within the schools uh, where we have teachers go in and do things. But uh, now, actually, I think Nell's on this call. She she can correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong. But we we had talked about 
possibly, and this was done in DC, giving children, uh, say in Lexington Park, little cameras, you know, little iPhone cameras or little cameras, and just have them photograph their world. And then blow those photographs up, their world, and, and they did this in DC, I think, I think of Anacostia, and they put them out in a wall, and maybe even a firehouse, and it was so powerful, because the kids were just showing their world, and it was beautiful. So that would be the kind of thing we could do here, and the Arts Council could help help pr uh, promote it or, or work with teachers in that way. Hey, and hey, so that would be one Bar way to do that. Do you know about Bar this, Kelsey? Do you I, know about the project? No, I don't, but I was going to say, could you please contact me on my day job, okay. because I have an idea. Okay. And it, it's, it's, you're, you're talking about it, and it's like, uh, get you, Roz, and I, I guess Mike, too, involved in this. Yeah. But it, it's, a similar, it's a similar process, but and I was looking at potentially... So you're the children, and you're teaching them that they're artists, that it's their eyes. What they see is the world, and we value their world, and we celebrate their world. So I would like to see that happen in St. Mary's County. So, Kelsey, I, 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 I was... <laughs> Yeah, I was just discussing that with a colleague two weeks ago. And I mean, it's scary because I didn't know about what was going on in DC. Yeah, I was yeah, thinking yeah. of a way that, that to mindset. utilize yeah. and have a better understanding of how to integrate, you know, possibly some of our students into working with, right. you know, students, students in the local community yeah. and, you know, kind of that, that synergy, you know, so that they can see, that there's more than, you know, that place that they drive past, yeah. you know, and, you know, like, yeah, you love the college, but there's so much more to this area than the college that can use your talents, so. I would love to see the college students involved with that, and I love that idea, Barbara, of having kids show what their world looks like um, to, to, to all of us. They're so beautiful. And how, and how, and how beautiful it is. Email me. We'll, we'll work on this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I hate to do this because I love this conversation. It is eight o'clock, um, and I do know there's um, uh, there are some other things happening in the greater uh, world in this country tonight, starting at eight. Um, so, um, oh, somebody says the Cove would be interested in such a, a photo voice project. So, Laura, maybe if you could let us know about that too. I want to specifically thank um, the St. Mary's County Library, Christine Biglin and Aaron Bates and Catherine. Yeah. De Cristofaro, they put this together um, for us to have this conversation and Sarah Stevenson has been helping with the tech background. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and I'll turn it back to you, Christine. Yeah. Oh, Nell, Nell, Nell endorses it. So good idea to panel. <laughs> yeah. She yeah. said they'd help. <laughs> That's good. Oh, thank you. Yay, David. Hi, David. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all so much for being part of our panel. Um, seeing as this is a, a library program, I need to talk about reading. So yeah. right, <laughs> right now, the um, library has a reading challenge that's called Read Woke, um, and it goes from October through May, and each month is focused on a different um, underrepresented group, and you're encouraged to read a book by an author from that group or about that group. Um, this month is uh, Hispanic Americans, next month is African Americans, and then it's a different group every month through May. Um, and if anyone's interested in joining that, they can go to the St. Mary's County Library website and register. Um, and I also emailed uh, everyone with the invitation link for the program, um, just a, a PDF file, and this is what it was printed out. It has uh, several books, some that are, have movie versions. If you'd like to be efficient about getting through the story, they're very good. Um, and the second page is other TED Talks because there are so many really wonderful ones. There are four listed on that um, PDF file that I sent along. Right, and Christine, um, we have another community conversation like this coming up in November. Do you wanna just mention that real quick? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I mentioned this series that we're running is the Community Conversations on Race. Um, and the library actually has 10 different programs that has been, have been going on this fall. Um, we have three left in October, two are acrylic painting classes. One is a discussion on desegregation, history of St. Mary's County. Um, and then in November on the 12th, we have another TED Talk discussion. Uh, and we'll be talking about uh, Nita Mosby Tyler's talk titled, How to Be an Unlikely Ally. 
and we're going to be talking about communication and how to have these difficult conversations. Um, and then we also have two book discussions in November also that you can find more about if you visit the library website. Great. And Sarah's put it up on our chat. Well, thank you again. Thank you to all our panelists. I wish we could have another another hour, but I'm sure <laughs> we all have other things to do. So thank you for your time and, and your preparation and your willingness to, to be with us tonight. Well, thanks. Thanks. Everyone. Thank you, Christine. Thank thanks you. for organizing this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you for letting us talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. It's been wonderful. Hi. Take care. Take care.